Hey there, Econ students. Welcome to the Mr. Sin channel. Today, we're going to be talking about perfect competition. This video is going to be going over how to interpret the charts and also what makes a market a perfect competitive market. Stick around as we explore microeconomics. Now in this video, we're going to be talking about perfect competition. And for you to understand all the important things, you need to be taking notes. I've made guided notes that go along with all of my videos. You can find them in the description below. You can click on the link, open up the notes, and purchase them if you're not one of my students. And that'll help actually support the channel, so thank you if you do. Feel free to subscribe as well. And now enough of these shameless plugs, but the whole point of this is use notes, take notes while watching these videos so that way you can remember things. Because the goal is for you to do well in your classes and to understand the concepts. Now, enough of me talking and plugging the channel. Let's get on to understanding a perfect competitive market. One of the important things to understand about perfect competition is it happens when our goods are identical. Now, what this means is that every person selling this type of good doesn't have an advantage over the other people. They're all the same goods. So there's no real reason why someone should go to a different company or person to buy that good. Because of this, people cannot change the price. So in perfect competition, the market price can change, yes, but individuals within that market who are selling or buying don't have enough influence to be able to change it. It's really easy to enter and exit this market, which then lets a lot of different people participate in it. Let's talk about strawberries for a second. Strawberries are a perfect example of perfect competitive markets. Let's say you go to the farmer's market. Everyone's charging around $4 for a basket of strawberries. If you decided to start planting your own strawberries, growing them right now, and you're going to go into this market, which you could at relatively low cost, and you decide to go in there and start selling them for $10, when the average price again is $4 for a basket, no one's going to buy your basket. It's way too expensive. The other thing too is at $4, if this is our equilibrium within the market and that's what has been determined, people will sell out of their product. So if I decide to lower my price and I'll go down to $2, I might sell out, but I could have also sold out if I would have sold it for $4. So all that happens is then I get less money. So there's no incentive for people to lower the cost and there's no incentive for people to raise. So that way the market stays the same. Now, if there was a big shifter that impacted all of the growing season, so if again we're talking about strawberries, let's say there's a massive drought and our supply of strawberries has decreased, then we would see a shift within the market. But again, this isn't one individual person who would be changing this. So the important thing to understand here is firms or people who are participating in this market are price takers. They'll take whatever price the market is set at. They are not makers. They can't change their price to what they want it to be. They just have to take what's given to them. Now, other things can happen with this as well. One thing that we can see is advertisement really doesn't happen here. It just adds on extra cost. If I can't change the price, I'm not going to go out of my way to then do ads and drive up my own cost for my company, business, or whatever it may be, because I can't raise my prices to increase my margins to be able to make up for that additional cost. So advertisement doesn't really happen here. Other things too, besides it being easy to enter and exit, is everyone is independently working and they're also all well informed. People understand what the average price should be. So you can't have people manipulating others and saying, hey, this is the actual price, $10 for these strawberries. People know that no, $4 is what everyone else is paying and that's what I'll probably pay. Now the important thing to understand with this now is how this stuff connects into our charts because that's going to be the confusing part of this. So let's now look at a market chart. We can see right now our supply and demand is being displayed at $20 and we can now also see our elastic and it's a perfectly elastic demand for our perfect competition. So on the right right now you can see my perfect competition chart. Notice how it's perfectly elastic, the demand. It's going straight across. And that's because at $20, which is our market price, this individual firm will sell out. At $20, that's what they can charge. It's up to them to decide how much to produce, but they will be selling out there. They can't change the price. We're price takers. That's why our market is going to match our perfectly elastic competitive market. So let's actually zoom in now on the individual firm, which is on the right side, and talk about what's gonna be happening here and where we would figure out how much we should produce. 
So this chart is showing an individual firm. Now this is a perfect competition. Now what we're seeing here is as this line goes straight across, that's showing perfectly elastic demand. We are set at $20. So we're gonna be selling at $20. This is also going to be our MR, our marginal revenue. Every time we sell one additional unit, we're gonna be getting another $20. So demand and our MR are gonna be the same here. So as we continue to go down and sell more, again, we're getting $20. I've said this a bunch now, hopefully you're starting to understand it. The next thing that we have to figure out is where should we actually produce? How much should we actually sell to people? This is one of the most important things in microeconomics, our profit maximization point. And we find this point by finding where our MC and our MR connect, where they equal each other. MC is our marginal cost. Just like our marginal revenue, this is dealing with if we are producing one more thing. However, this is looking at if I sell one more, how much more am I paying? Now, if we go over MC and MR, what starts to happen is we are going to lose money. Now, on this graph, you can see right here, our marginal cost and our marginal revenue cross at 40. So we should be producing 40 units. As soon as we go over 40, what's going to happen? Notice how our marginal cost continues to go up. What would happen then is our marginal revenue stays the same. So if we keep going forward and producing more, we're still just getting 20 every time we make an additional unit. But as soon as we go over that, that cross point, that profit maximization, what starts to occur then is now we are actually paying more than 20. We are starting to pay more and we were receiving less. So our profit margins continue to go down. If we continue to go all the way down, eventually we might be losing money as well. Now, in order to figure out actually what our profits are, since I just mentioned it, we have to look at another cost curve. This is gonna be our average total cost, our ATC. Sometimes it's just shortened to AC, our average cost. Now, the important thing here is to go back to our profit maximization point. We already know this is where we're gonna produce. So this is the only spot right now in this chart that we really care about. We are gonna go straight up from the bottom, so you'll go from where your quantity is, we'll go up, and as soon as you bump into the line, which is gonna be our ATC, then you would go all the way over to the left and see what price it is. To figure out our cost there, it's similar to the total revenue test. We'll just times our price by our quantity, and that would be our cost. Now, in order to figure out our total revenue here, and eventually to get to our profit, we're not gonna go to that ATC. We're gonna go all the way up to that $20, to the top of our demand, because we're selling it for 20. And then we'll times that by our quantity. That'll show us our total revenue. If we wanted to figure out what our profit is, all we would have to do is take our total revenue and we'd have to minus it by our costs. Remember, we found our costs out from just going straight up that profit maximization line and going over to the left to figure out the cost. Again, we're going to be taking the price there that's lined up with our average total cost and we'll times it by the quantity. That would show us our profit. And that's about it. That is showing a perfect competitive market and how we would be able to determine where our profit maximization point is, where our costs are, and our profit. If at any point, let's say our ATC is above our line there, our elastic demand, well, we would be at a loss. It wouldn't make sense for us to stay in this market. We would have no profit and we're actually taking a loss. We would eventually go bankrupt. So that's just one important thing to understand. Now, different things can change this demand. It might fluctuate, but it has to be the market. It's not individual firms. Hopefully this video kind of helped you better understand perfect competition and how the charts work with it, how the market itself is actually working, how individual firms have to follow the different rules within these markets and what's happening and why it's happening. If it helped you out, please subscribe and support the channel. I'm gonna have more videos coming up soon and some of these will actually be continuing this conversation on perfect competition. Make sure in fact to check out the video on the table, which will explain all the stuff from the chart but show you in a table form because you'll You'll have to be able to understand that for your tests as well. Until next time, I'm Mr. Sin. Thanks for stopping by and I'll talk to you later.